multimedia, but old-fashioned multimedia. Okay. You want me to sit? You going to stand? I'll come over there. Okay. All right. Okay. Stand here. You you get the. So we we still have seventy seconds. So take your time. Anyway, hi, I'm Victor Nevesky. We're very glad that you're all here, and um, welcome to the. Uh, Rick was going to come earlier this year, and the weather defeated that evening, but here we are. So we're very glad that everyone is here and that the weather has permitted us to be here. Um, I had forgotten, Rick, that you graduated from this university in 1978 with a BA in history. And then two years later, he persuaded his grandfather's charitable foundation to partner in creating and funding a Harper's Magazine Foundation, which acquired and operated Harper's Magazine and still does. And Rick, as you know, serves as the president and publisher of Harper's Magazine. He's been a reporter. Uh, I don't know if this speaks in your favor or not, Rick, but he's been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Star, the Bergen Record, and the Chicago Sun-Times, all, as I calculated, in two years. So either everything worked out very well and you kept getting hired away, or you, were, you ran into trouble wherever you were, but you can enlighten us on that. He's also been an editor at the United Press International. He received the Baltimore Sun's H.L. Mencken Writing Award, his books, Second Front Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War, and the Selling of Free Trade, NAFTA, Washington, and Subversion of Democracy have come out and gotten glowing reviews. Under his stewardship, Harper's Magazine has won more national magazine awards than I can count. And, uh, and it's a tribute both to Rick and the editors that he has hired and supported over the years. This isn't the first time that Rick has given a Delacorte lecture, but it's a special pleasure and privilege to have him back this year. Since last week, we heard the very eloquent lecture on the glories of the online world. It's fitting and proper that we hear from Rick, who has his own very different perspective on the internet. So, Rick, it's all yours. And then he'll take questions from you. So listen closely. <clears throat> How many of you have read a book called Naming Names? So we'll see if anybody gets my jokes at the end. I mean, it's a broadly speaking a joke at the end. Uh, when I began my tenure as publisher of Harper's uh, Magazine nearly 30 years ago, my biggest challenge, or so I thought at the time, was to get advertising agencies to pay more attention to this celebrated Journal of American Ideas and literature entrusted to my care. Harper's had tens of thousands of loyal readers, but not many loyal advertisers. So my task seemed clear. Fawning over salesmen, however, rubbed against my political grain. But those days were dominated by the free market dogma of the Reagan administration, and I fell prey to some of the president's most simple-minded thinking. Um, if advertisers didn't sufficiently admire serious readers of the Harper's variety, then it was my job to persuade Madison Avenue and its clients that I was serious about their concerns about selling their products to my readers. And oh, how we sold. Uh, for 20 years, editor Lewis Lapham and I crisscrossed the country in pursuit of what everyone else in our business was after, glossy, high-profile consumer and corporate advertising. Armed with our good name, Harper's, after all, was deeply enmeshed in America's uh, cultural and historical fabric. We maneuvered our way into company dining rooms from Wall Street to Rockefeller Center, from Louisville to St. Louis, 
from Boise to Palo Alto. We engaged our hosts in discussions of the political and literary issues of the day, but to better impress them, we also invoked our affinity with the advertising world, presenting as evidence the brief stint on the Harper's board of the legendary, legendary ad man, uh, William J. Burnback, as well as our own very slick house ad produced by the renowned, uh, renowned firm of Scally McCabe Sloves. It didn't hurt our cause that my late father, Roderick, was something of an advertising genius. I spoke the language of the advertising trade because, along with journalism and politics, I'd absorbed it nearly every day of my childhood at the kitchen table. It also didn't hurt that Lewis Lapham and I were spawned by the very business establishment we criticized in nearly every issue of, of America's oldest continuously published monthly. Now, current readers and you uh, may be surprised to learn that we were largely successful in our efforts. Many corporations encouraged their ad agencies to take a fresh look at Harper's Magazine, and the ads began to roll in. For my part, I was astonished that most of the CEOs we met, though nearly all Republicans, were, lar were barely ideological and almost never objected uh, to the subversive, sometimes overtly anti-capitalist articles that appeared in our pages. As our advertising revenue grew, I rarely worried about reprisals for anything we published. Indeed, one of the most stinging critiques I ever heard of George W. Bush's disastrous invasion of Iraq came from the chairman of a major American oil company over lunch at his headquarters in Houston. For many of these men, and for their more liberal-minded advisors, Harper's and its brand of open-minded, freewheeling discourse were automatically worthy of their backing. But as the magazine's bottom line improved through the dot-com boom that ended in 2000 and the anti-Bush boom that ended in 2009, something crucial seemed to be missing from our marketing equation, as we used to call it. In all my scurrying back and forth between Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York, I never considered a fundamental question. Why did a magazine of ideas, criticism, and reporting need to serve as a sales medium between advertisers and readers? Why should advertising be our principal means of support? Not that I didn't want advertising or have respect for our advertisers, some of whom were genuinely civic-minded, but wasn't the truly important compact, really the, only, really the only relationship that mattered between reader and writer, or to some extent, reader, writer, and editor. Harper's is published first and foremost to be read. If the magazine functions as an intermediary, it is between the creative imagination of the fiction writer or essayist and the creative spirit of the sensitive reader between the inquiring mind of the journalist and the engaged mind <laughs> of the alert, occasionally outraged citizen. This compact, I believe, uh, needs to be stated forcefully and in unmistakable terms. Now, as it happens, uh, recent technology has brutally pressed my question about the appropriate connection between reader, writer, and advertiser on every publisher in our increasingly wired up world. Uh, I was immediately suspicious of the internet being touted, and Victor is my witness from my Delacorte lecture back in 2000. But I was, I was already uh, skeptical in the late 90s as a, of the idea that it was going to be this miraculously efficient publishing platform because of the web's capacity for massive copyright violation. But what disturbed me more as a publisher and a writer was the ugly commodification of writing itself, the renaming of prose and poetry as something called content. Suddenly, my colleagues and competitors were reducing well-wrought sentences and stories to the level of screws and bolts. Not only was content an empty and offensive word, but my fellow publishers also proposed to give it away free in the quest of more advertising. Instead of honoring the reader, writer, and editor, this new approach to the publishing business insulted them, both by devaluing their work and by feeding it 
with little or no remuneration to search engines, which in turn feed information to advertising agencies and, as it turns out, to the government. The result, as anyone with even a passing interest uh, can observe, has been catastrophic. Uh, massive layoffs of editorial employees, the collapse of major publications, the impoverishment of writers, the alarming decline of editorial standards for accuracy, grammar, and coherent thought, and the dumbing down of journalism across the board. Great American public, uh, publishing institutions such as the Washington Post and the Boston Globe have been sold for a fraction of their former value. Meanwhile, the advertisers themselves have fled traditional publications for the allegedly greener pastures of social media and Google. Paradoxically, the more adv advertisers demanded eyeballs and clicks, the more writing the publishers gave away and the less advertisers advertised. We know what happens to Lemmings. Thanks to YouTube, you can watch it in graphic detail any time of the day or night. So I decided early on I wouldn't join in, <clears throat> I wouldn't join in the frenzy of free content. From the launching of our, our website in 2003, we at Harper's insisted that subscribers continue to pay to read our well-written, fact-checked, scrupulously edited, and extremely entertaining paragraphs. When the magazine became fully accessible online, our paywall remained firm. We are pleased, uh, of course, to offer the magazine in a digital format, but what we won't do is to give in to the free content logic, the so-called logic of so many publications. Tellingly, very few subscribers have complained, and we are still in business, albeit with difficulty, having conceded nothing in the quality of our character or, dare I say, our content. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, paywalls are being erected everywhere. Even the champion blogger Andrew Sullivan is asking his readers to pay $20 a year for unlimited access to his work. But, as with global warming, uh, so much damage has already been done to the literary and journalistic atmosphere that I'm afraid we're approaching a point of no return. I can't quite believe my ears at the nonsense still being peddled by the advocates of free content. Who needs fact checkers when we have crowdsourcing to correct the record? Why doesn't Harper's give away a particularly good investigative piece, uh, such as Ted Conover's powerful undercover report last May on an industrial slaughterhouse, uh, just so that more people will read it. Uh, and my answer, of course, is because good publishing, good editing, and good writing cost money, and publishers, editors, and writers have to earn a living. We are proud that we can send a photographer to Iran for a couple of weeks and then deliver the resulting images to readers. Uh, this was back in our September issue. Through the mail on good paper and over the internet, in high resolution uh, images for computer screens and tablets. This photographer who requested an anonymity risked arrest and prison to take excellent pictures, as do other photographers uh, for Harper's, for the benefit of Harper's and you. The censors in Tehran were surely upset. Shouldn't anonymous be paid for this courage and skill? Shouldn't Harper's be compensated for sending Anonymous into the field? All told, the photo essay cost us about $25,000, including printing, paper, and mailing. It is unreasonable to expect that an advertiser would s directly sponsor such daring photography. It is wishful thinking to believe that parasitic Google, now bloated with billions of dollars worth of what I, considered, what I consider a pirated property, will ever willingly pay Harper's or Anonymous anything at all for the right to distribute Anonymous's pictures. Although it's worth noting that the German government is fighting Google on behalf of German publishers and writers over this very point. We cannot even count on America's enlightened public libraries to help foot the bill for Anonymous. I recently found myself in the Lenox, Massachusetts Public Library where Harper's Magazine is currently unavailable. When our circulation director complained that the magazine that published Edith Wharton's short stories, many written just down the road at the Mount, 
deserve pride of place in the library's periodicals section, she was told that budget cuts had made it impossible for the library to pay for a subscription. We, however, uh, find it logical to trust that 150,000 or so discriminating Harper subscribers, tens of thousands of newsstand buyers, and thousands, so far, of on-screen readers will find it in their interest to pay substantially more for a magazine that publishes such outstanding material. This seems as evident to me today as my conceptually flawed advertising model did 30 years ago. And I'm beginning to sense a turning of the tide both in the quantity of new, scribers, uh, new subscribers, many of them signing up through our website, and in the supportive emails and letters we receive every day that praise what we do. Now, it has been a trying decade uh, for publishers and writers all over, the year, all over the world, and our challenges can sometimes seem overwhelming. In the United States, unfortunately, the, bankruptcy of, the bankrupting of journalists and authors has been matched by an impoverished debate about how to sustain a high standard of publishing and writing. Until recently, the rush to appear modern, the peer pressure to accept the inevitability of print's demise, and the supposed virtues of writing for free have, domin have dominated what po passes for a discussion. I'm quoting somebody, is there a living to be made when editors expect to get quality on-time copy for zero cents a word? This was asked by Mark Kingwell a while back uh, in Harper's uh, in a piece we republished, a Canadian philosopher. And the answer, of course, certainly not unless we lower our standards and redefine the meaning of good writing. Now, some voices of sanity, though, have been heard in Europe, in England most notably that of Tyler Brulé, editor-in-chief of Monocle and fast lane columnist for the largely paywalled and still profitable Financial Times. More compelling still has been the experience of the French publisher Laurent Beccaria, founder of the book publishing company Les Arènes and a quarterly general interest magazine called 21, uh, together with his editor Patrick de Saint-Exupéry, uh, Beccaria has defied the conventional wisdom about the free content model and turned 21 into the most dynamic and perhaps the most profitable new magazine on the European scene. Although it does have a website, you cannot read 21 on a computer. You must buy the print edition for the equivalent of about $20 a copy at a bookstore or get it through the mail. The quality of 21, 21 is guaranteed not by fickle marketers suffering from short attention spans, but by faithful readers whose powers of concentration, whose appreciation for the elegant sentence and the hard-earned insight have survived the onslaught of the web's unedited mediocrity. This January, uh, Beccaria and Saint-Exupéry published a manifesto in 21, this is, I'm sorry, January 2013, uh, that sought to reclaim the journalistic territory conceded too easily to online, unpaid, snippet journalism. We published a, an excerpt in our reading section last October that I believe speaks for itself, although I urge you to read the whole thing uh, uh, online or in print. Beccaria and Saint-Exupéry offer many smart observations, but this one seemed paramount for my purposes and for the continued health of Harper's Magazine and of journalism in general. Quote, pompous phrases about the need to reinvent the press's economic model mask the reality. What has to be restored in, is the exchange value between news publications and their readers. How many of us would agree to spend two or three dollars for an espresso down in five minutes, but would balk at forking over the same for a daily or weekly news organ as these are currently conceived? To be useful, desirable, and necessary, that's the only economic model worth considering. It's as old as the world, as old as commerce. Thus, uh, shall we proceed at Harper's uh, in partnership with advertisers who recognize the profit in being associated with a magazine of the highest editorial standards, 
and with our extraordinary paying readers. We are investing heavily in reporting and photojournalism. I hope you've noticed uh, we're consistently running more pages than we have in decades. Along the way, I've learned that to be useful, desirable, and necessary is to serve the reader and the writer, not the internet or the consumer or the lords of merchandising. Harper's Magazine is not a cutting board for sausages sold at a certain cost per thousand. It is, among other things, what the late Senator uh, Patrick Moynihan called the fulcrum of American letters and public comment. It's the storehouse of the American experience dating back 163 years, including much of the country's greatest belles lettres, journalism, and increasingly art and photography. At our best, we provoke, and this really is my intention, we provoke that zigzag streak of lightning through the brain. That is a phrase Edward Gray uh, used, quoting Lord Asquith to describe Winston Churchill. When a reader's mind is pierced by an understanding or a realization that was previously inaccessible. But Harper's is also an agreement between reader, writer, and publisher to reject spoon-fed, tailored solutions. And that goes for the internet publishing model as much as it goes for invading Iraq, democratizing Afghanistan, and protecting the American population from terrorists by warrantless spying on every last one of us. We hope to do better than just survive. We'd also like to help bring the national conversation back to a level of intelligence, comprehension, and authenticity that will make our readers and contributors proud. A literary and political conversation, I hope, in the spirit of the great editor Maxwell per Perkins, who, feeling pressured to make Ernest Hemingway conform to the short-term short exigencies and whims of the marketplace, wrote to Hemingway in 1935, quote, all you have to do is follow your own judgment or instinct and disregard what is said and convey the absolute bottom quality of each person, situation, and thing. I can get pretty depressed, but even at worst, I still believe, and it's written in all the past, that the utterly real thing in writing is the only thing that counts, and the whole racket melts down before it. Now, if I may, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on what I wrote, because I wrote this six months ago and update you on the publishing scene as I see it. Uh, in some ways, things have gotten worse. These may seem like mere anecdotes, but it is nonetheless a frightening sign of the times that New York Magazine, an iconic weekly, has gone bi-weekly to save money. Closer to home, I am even more disturbed to learn that my old college paper, the Columbia Daily Spectator, wants to go to weekly publication and devote more money, more energy to its so-called digital focus. Google, meanwhile, continues its scorched earth march through copyright territories, once controlled by publishers and writers, while Amazon puts more bookstores out of business and buys the Washington Post. And then there's the very well-reported cover story of the current Columbia Journalism Review. Who cares if it's true? That's the cover line which I found deeply depressing. The saddest thing in the, in the piece is hearing the voices of all those good people at the, at the York Record, a Pennsylvania daily, trying so hard to keep a stiff upper lip, trying so hard to make the digital print mix work. But their jobs sound almost insane in their shredded, unfocused com complexity. The bottom line is this, and I quote the writer for CJR, Mark Fisher, quote, in the record newsroom, veterans and newcomers alike care a great deal about truth and standards. But the record's ambition is diminished, its daily coverage less comprehensive. The editors proudly show me the stellar project work they've done of late, a series on diabetes, an admirable long-term commitment to chronicling the travails of returning war veterans. But any notion of full, regular coverage of the region's towns once the record's core function has fallen away." Unquote. Print advertising industry-wide continues to decline, although last year not as dramatically as I feared. 
Nevertheless, uh, there are some encouraging signs as well. My essay in the October Harper's got me interviewed at length on NPR's weekend edition, for example. I recently shared with my staff the bracing news that four uh, previously all digital publications, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Politico, Pitchfork, and Pando have all launched print editions. Paywalls, as I said earlier, uh, are sprouting everywhere. Uh, some are pseudo paywalls, like the new one at Slate. But the two, the two year old uh, one at the Minneapolis Star Tribune is real. So is the paywall at Newsday. That doesn't mean too much at this point, but perhaps not all lemmings are created equal. Over in France, meanwhile, uh, 21 and Le Canard Enchaîné uh, continue to make healthy profits. And here I get to do my. Uh, because it, it gives you an idea. This is to underline just how different they are and yet how successful they are with not only no advertising, but no, no, with no, available, uh, no availability on the, on the web. Uh, 21, as you can see, is an objet. It's a big, thick thing. Uh, no advertising, 15 euros a copy. It sells 50, 60,000 copies. Uh, it's, a, it's a quarterly. Uh, it sells about 50 to 60,000 copies uh, an issue. Um, so the critics in France will say, oh, that's just an objet. Uh, people want to be seen with it, or something like that. They're not, they're not really reading it. But the Canal Enchaîné is manifestly not an objet. It's ugly, wild, sort of uh, ugly typography, eight pages, no advertising, circulation of over half a million, five, more than 500,000. It is the most profitable newspaper in France. Le Monde, Le Figaro, losing money like crazy with their unpaywalled content. Um, but as I was saying, I'm, I'm optimistic in, in some other ways because I also have some hope, thanks to these examples, uh, that Europe will eventually lead the way in corralling Google, since the United States does not have the will to do it and force this immense parasite to pay all publications, authors, and photographers to excerpt their articles and photographs. The law in Germany is the toughest, as you may know, although it's proving very hard to enforce. And I'm sorry to say that uh, French publishers have been much more accommodating than the Germans, though this, things are starting to stir there. But more importantly, I think that the wider community of writers and readers is beginning to realize that internet publishing, including free content, is another version of the god that failed. Is it, does everyone recognize that title? Okay, so yeah, the four people who read naming names, names get, know what I'm talking about. Does it, everyone recognize, I, I mean, excuse me, it's, it, it's a collection, as he says, of, of essays by former, former communists, including Arthur Kessler, who wrote the lead essay, all of them disillusioned by the end result of Marxist or Soviet ideology. While their ultimate aims uh, are very different from old-time communists, the proponents of supposedly democratic, all-digital, crowdsourced journalism share many of the same smug, obnoxious, and condescending mannerisms as diehard communists. I now call these people digitally correct, which of course is a play on politically correct, uh, the term once used to, dis to criticize and mock the Communist Party line. Arthur Kessler describes being recruited into the German Communist Party in 1932 by someone named Edgar, quote, a smooth and smiling blonde young man of about 30, who sounds to me a lot like some of the web publishing salesmen I've met over the years. Kessler recalls that he told Edgar he had qualms about the party line. Why couldn't the communists build a common front against Hitler alongside the socialists? Why did the CP insist on call calling socialists social fascists? Edgar's reply in brief was that social democrats were traitors to the working class who would inevitably sell out the communists and the workers. As Kessler described the German communist mentality, quote, both morally and logically, the party was infallible. Morally, because its aims were right, that is, in accord with the dialectic of history, and these aims justified all means. 
logically because the party was the vanguard of the proletariat and the proletariat the embodiment of the active principle in history." Unquote. This makes me think of the slogan, information wants to be free, which is pure cant. And the notion that the prince, uh, and also the notion that prince death is inevitable, which has so far been proven wrong. I won't push this analogy any further than trying to get a couple of laughs, but I must tell you that my critics have been as opaque, occasionally as intolerant, and most certainly as humorless as a 1930s Communist Party militant. I'm still hearing this nonsense uh, that some, somehow everything will work out for the best because free, unregulated content on the internet is revolutionary and a, is a revolutionary and democratic concept located on the right side of history, a concept and a movement that are as inevitable as the demise of capitalism predicted by Marx. Ironically, to be fully committed to digital correctness is to be largely hostile, uh, excuse me, largely hostage uh, to monopolistic practices controlled by huge capitalistic multinational companies. The narrow-minded, true believer tone of the web ideologues, and I'm talking about people like Clay Shirky at NYU and Alan Rusbridger at The Guardian newspaper, really needs to be challenged and examined. And with that, I invite you to challenge me with some questions. Thanks very much. Should I sit? Sit, sit, okay. yeah. yeah. Come join in the conversation. Um, so how has your, you've carried this message, Rick, around the country and then some, and how, how is it received? Uh, well, initially my message was received with hostility and ridicule because I was on the wrong side of history. And obviously I was anti-democratic, I was a fascist or something. I mean, uh, I can't push the analogy far enough to make myself a premature anti-fascist. It doesn't work. I'm sure you figured it out, yeah. But, <laughs> but I, I got a lot of flack and a lot of hostility and a lot of uh, indifferent stares from advertisers. Uh, but more recently, as I see everything uh, moving more in my direction, um, uh, you know, I, it's not like people are hoisting me on their shoulders and saying you were right, nobody wants to admit that. Uh, but there's a kind of sullen um, acknowledgement that maybe I had a point, and that's why I think NPR put me on the air. Um, um, but you know, there's still a large segment of the media audience that doesn't want to hear it. I just don't get the letters anymore, the real angry, nasty letters I used to get from, from people saying, uh, why, isn't it, you know, why isn't it online for free, and what are you, some kind of an idiot, and so on and so forth. Why don't you want to be part of the conversation? <laughs> I said, I am part of the conversation. I just want you to pay to read the articles. It's not complicated. People will still write in saying, why can't, I get, why can't I read this online? You can't read it online, you just have to pay for it. And the, the more difficult thing, very quickly, is probably than that, because I, you know, I'm used to this sort of thing, is persuading the writers that I'm not shortchanging them. Uh, but I think I've converted a lot of writers and photographers uh, to my uh, point of view. They have to now fend off their colleagues uh, I, we just did a, in the current issue, the previous issue, we did a, uh, a drone's eye view of America. We have had a photographer send a drone up with a camera, and he took pic, yeah, it's that one, he took pictures, it took pictures of, um, as a drone in Afghanistan would take pictures of similar sites, weddings, funerals, military assemblies, and so on and so forth, uh, the sort of things where we hit people with drones by accident. Uh, a real tour de force. Anyway, he, he got some positive, you know, feedback, and he got on television. But he also got a lot of flack from fellow photographers. Why can't we get this? So I've just been reliably informed. Uh, why can't we see it for free? And I've just been reliably informed that uh, the uh, all the newsstands around the ICP are sold out of Harper's, or sold out of Harper's. I think something like that. Um. <clears throat> You know, the, the, to me, the, 
Um, one of the paradoxes is that in the academic world, academics are used to not getting paid for their articles in scholarly journals, and they survive by virtue of their salaries, and they are more mm. interested in having their articles read than in making money from them. Um, so how does that fit into the problem that we're facing? Because I know it comes up at the Authors Guild, which you used to be on the council of. No, I still am. I still, I still am. are. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. But you didn't show up at the last week's meeting, whatever it was. Yeah, because I, I, I missed it. But then I stayed for the, for the uh, General Assembly afterwards, good. Okay. where I got to proselytize to my fellow writers uh, that they shouldn't write for free. And, and of course, I got the, the usual um, response, which is the publisher, publishers are, are screwing them. Uh, they won't spend a nickel on promotion. And the only way they can get any promotion is by writing for free for the Huffington Post. And I said, well, it's a vicious circle. You know, you keep doing this, uh, and, and right. there'll be no end to it. They'll always ask for more for free. Right. And I know lots of... Um, and also, even you know, even in, it's even reaching into into academia because there are some professors who like to get paid. Is occasionally asked to get paid. I saw I was having lunch with Bob Paxton, Robert Paxton, the distinguished distinguished history, historian of Vichy France. And he said, "Hey, you know, it's true. People are constantly asking me to do things for free now, where they wouldn't have done it before, it's particularly for lectures. I mean, not even an honorarium." Uh, uh, so it's, it's reached in, but for the average freelance writer, it's catastrophic. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't make a living anymore. You just can't make a living. I mean, there is, a, to me, a contradiction in the conventional analysis of the problem that is facing newspapers and magazines today, because the analysis is that the, um, the problem is that people uh, can get it, it's partly your analysis, people can get it free over there, and so advertisers have stopped paying for ads in, um, <clears throat> and, and so advertising has gone down because circulation has gone down because people have stopped reading. On the one hand, on the other hand, advertising on the web, the advertisers won't pay as much as they do for advertising in print. So I always say, well, the advertisers must know something that you don't know because they're, they're not paying for it on the web. They are paying for it in print, and they understand that they get more value for their money in there. So how, do you, how does one put those things together? And you're giving part of the answer. Well, That's, we try to do it on sales calls, although it's very hard to get a sales call anymore. I mean, you, the ad agencies are so besotted with social media and Google and so on that they can't be bothered with most uh, print salesmen anymore. Right. And, but if I do get in to see somebody or my ad director gets in to see somebody, uh, some of them will acknowledge, oh, well, our proprietary research shows that there's the retention rate on online is very low, and I, you know, we go no shit. You know, look at the way people read it. I mean, and also, uh, you're hitting the what do you call it? The, the cancel button. You know, the, the right. The, delete. the what? The delete button. The delete button, not the delete button. You know, to get rid of the the pop up ad, the minute it comes up, you, nobody wants to see that. Whereas, in a magazine or a newspaper, you know, it, you turning the pages, it sneaks up on you. It doesn't get in your way. Uh, in terms of, if, in a way of reading the, the article, so it's not as offensive. Okay, got a question. Just, Could yeah, you come yeah. up to the microphone, please, and ask from the microphone and just say who you are oh, and also. Uh, my name is Anton Makovsky. I'm an alumnus, and I used to be a freelance writer, and now I'm a lawyer, but I still write. Um, just, just on the advantage that a print magazine can have over the, to get the, your advertising uh, placement, I've noticed that my subscription to Esquire now has about four of these um, perfume samples or cologne samples, you know, with a, and, and not to mention maybe other magazines like Vanity Fair or, you know, and this is something that, that Google and Facebook cannot do. And also, of course, the quality of illustration. I mean, if you've got a fashion layout and it's beautifully printed in color, 
that's going to be an advantage for the print medium. Um, anyway, just had a couple of comments. You want to help sell space for me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, like that. I'll write great. for you. All right. You, come, yeah. you mentioned this, ma this French magazine that's only sold on newsstands or by mail order. O only in bookstores. Okay, now, this wait one. A minute, this wait a one. You mentioned um, um, uh, Amazon and how they have damaged the, the uh, trade of the bookstores. It seems to me that there, I don't do it, but there is room for a thing called ebooks. And people like to read in that format. They can carry around 20 novels on, on, a, on an iPad, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, and they would, you know, how would you carry 20 hardcover books in a backpack? It would be very heavy. So I don't see why this 21 is not available as an ebook for the same price or maybe a tiny bit less. And the same thing with your content. If you want to have a paywall, let's say somebody wants that photo essay from Iran. It could be two dollars or three dollars as an ebook, or if somebody wants uh, Conover's essay, it could be a dollar. Yeah, $2, but you, $5, what you're $5. arguing for is here is the Amazon singles concept, which is a nickel and dime operation, but it, which it runs which runs down the value of the overall magazine. No, I but mean, no, if you start going down that, model. if you go down that road, you're you're basically saying you know the bits and pieces of Harper's Magazine are Harper's Magazine. That's not the, that's not no, what we're no, selling. No, but so. if it's a special issue or like, look. Uh, yeah. The New Yorker published, uh, what was it, Hersey, uh, when he did Hiroshima, who yeah. was, am I wrong? That became a book. It started out as a long-form magazine piece, yeah. maybe an entire issue, but it was re reissued. So, I mean, it's just a, a model of how much you want to charge. I mean, a lot of the books on, on uh, e-books are $5 or $9 at the most. Yeah, but they're too cheap, and, and that's what's killing the book business, is that the p book publishers are now, uh, they don't do windowing. It's called windowing, where you... You put out the hardcover first, and then six months later, you put out the paperback. They're going straight to hardcover. They're going to hardcover and straight to ebook, which is killing the paperback market, which is killing the bookstores, the independent bookstores. And when there are no more independent bookstores, uh, you wait and see how great it's going to be for American oh, publishing I'm negotiating with Amazon. We we did a uh, James Marcus, who used to work at the CGR did the best review of the Bezos biography in Harper's, uh, the biography of Bezos, and in it he revealed, uh, I think he's got a pretty good source, that you've now got to pay a million dollars just to get in the door at Amazon to present your list, a million dollars up front. And that's what the big six publishers, I'm sure, are doing. Well, so that's crazy. Okay, okay but uh, I don't want to get along we should have more of a well, conversation with you. Can have more. I mean, I disagree. I disagree with you. I have a couple of other things. People I'll, have told I'll me give that. Give them a chance, yeah, and I'll okay, come back because okay. I've been I've been distilling this. Yeah, but people have been telling me to go Amazon singles for a long time. Yeah. First of all, I don't want to get in bed with Amazon. Uh, but, yeah, but, yeah, if you want to ask a question, yeah, yeah. can you come up to the microphone, yeah. please? Yeah. yeah. There, there's a woman back there. You, you had your hand up earlier. Why don't you come and ask the next question, and then people can get online behind you. Good. I, I have to disagree you with are. you. My, my name is Patricia Murray. I'm a journalist and I live in Valencia, in Spain. I've just, uh, a few months ago, I started a cooperative for journalists. And uh, I have to disagree with you because you compared journalists to uh, professors. Now, a professor has his salary because he's, uh, as you said, he's a professor in, in, in a learning institution. And then he writes apart from that. But journalists don't have this advantage. Neither one of us compared journalists right, to well, I, did. I thought I, you, I you did. The, yeah. I raised the question of professors who write yes. for journals and don't get paid for them. Yeah. For yes. journals, not yeah. for yes. newspapers. Yes, or, yes yeah. Yeah, they, they write for yeah. journals. But they're getting a salary. They have a salary. Yeah, right. They have right. Their, right. yeah, well, the problem with journalists is they don't have this, like, second. Right. They're just get, trying to live off what Exactly, they're right. Yeah. And I live in Spain. I work in Spain. And the problem there is, as what you put it, everybody wants everything for free. And I run uh, several digital magazines, and people send me things, and you get an email where it puts, for immediate publication, and then they're ringing me up the next morning, have I published it, when am I going to publish it? And I said, well, like, how much are you going to pay for me to publish this? This is an advertisement for a product. So I'm going to publish this on my magazine for free to promote your product. How much are you going to pay me? Oh, it's all of, everything on the internet is free. I said, well, like we ha we we have to sit down. We've got to write it. It's our time. We've we've in invested years and years of studying journalism. We have a, a, all of us ha have a higher education, 
and we're using the electricity, we're using our time at the computer, and uh, space on, on the internet. So this all costs money. So you, you want to get your product advertised free. They don't understand this. They think it's, everything is free right. because it's on the internet. Right, right. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Steve. Steven Schlesinger, I'm from the Sensory Foundation. Outside of the internet, your magazines would be facing other problems. Uh, first of all, you have a younger generation that doesn't read and is proud of it. Second of all, you have 500 TV stations, which everybody, you know, wastes their time on. You have higher postal rates. I mean, there are a lot of other issues besides the internet that impact on, on magazines. And I'm not sure that you really dealt with those issues. Well, uh, you want me to, I don't want to bore you with, <laughs> with our problems with postal rates. Um, but the, the internet is fundamentally the problem because Google has gone from zero advertising revenue to, was it, 46 billion in 10 years, and newspaper and magazine uh, revenue has dropped more or less com commensurately. Uh, so if Google is writing on the back of all the content produced, sorry, I use the word, all the writing produced by people like Victor and me and the rest of you, uh, and it's work, uh, essentially distributing it uh, for free or offering it up for free with a link, uh, and then selling it to advertisers, selling the, the eyeballs to advertisers, that's piracy. It should be illegal. but. Uh, According to our lobbyist, uh, I've got to get this uh, nailed down. The Obama administration supposedly has, what, 75 former employees of Google working, working in it right now. Anyway, Google has got the upper hand. Uh, so yeah, it's always been a problem with, uh, with uh, postage rates. It's always been, the Xerox machine has always been a problem. I like to make fun of the internet by calling it a giant Xerox machine, the world's biggest Xerox machine. Um, um, but I also, I don't agree with you that the younger generation isn't reading. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, f sometimes flabbergasted, but pleasantly surprised by the number of people I meet in their teens and their 20s who not only still read, uh, but read in print and read at length because they're burned out on the snippet journalism that I'm talking about. They realize they've been sold a bill of goods. or. Uh, they're like these poor uh, working stiffs at the York Record who are, you know, it's really, I really recommend this story. Uh, it's really well done. Uh, you know, you just feel for them. I was a reporter. I know it was hard enough just trying to do a story for the newspaper. They've got to do 10 different things in a day, and they can't do anything thoroughly. So it's, uh, I would imagine they're sick of it too. Can I add one complication, Steve, and I'll be interested in your thought about this, <clears throat> is the same folks, you and I, who point out, Rick, to the contrary, notwithstanding that millennials don't read, see millennials reading all the time. The thing is, they don't read books, they read on their phones, they read on a That's new true. app that is invented. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a new app invented every day, but Social scientists tell us that these apps, including the phone, you can now read books on your phone, and that people are starting to do that. So there are these weird counter trends, and the question is, should you pay for it? And as a matter of public policy, you know, there are folks who have argued for a long time that the mails ought to be delivered free, and that we ought to invest in the public sector in ways that serve public values. and the, and. So how you govern all these new apps as they come up and the role of the FCC and all that is up for grabs in the policy arena which the 20th century or the Century Foundation ought to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to make one But I, I, Let me give you a practical thing. I really do believe, I, I'm not sure the German law actually does this, but I think it, it, it implies or is pushing towards the notion that Google should have to pay to link to anything. Could you imagine how that would change the, the publishing scene if Google had to pay for every single link? Right now they're getting a free ride. And then it's up to us whether we want to give it away for free or not, whether the link is free. But charge them up front. I kind of like that idea. 
No, it's a positive. Yeah. Just one last point, which yeah, is, yeah. I agree with you, Victor. The, the one hope for the generation I'm talking about, and I must say, I, I'm talking to different young people than you are, uh, they do read on the internet, and that is the one thing that may lead to a greater appreciation of reading than, than the fact is that they don't pick up a magazine right. or, or a book. But well, the, other, the other thing with public policy is that you know, in Germany and in the Scandinavian countries, there is this thing called library lending rights where writers get paid when right. books are taken out of the public library. Right. And it's just a whole different orientation to how you think about how you want to reward literary production, writers, and scholars in this country as well. So, okay, thanks. Right. Thank you. Good evening. Janelle Drones, my name. I sincerely appreciate the information that you've given. And speaking of NPR, is listening today and your commentary about uh, photojournalism, and there's a Pulitzer. Uh, that got um, a photojournalist who got a Pulitzer for his coverage of that uh, massacre in Nairobi, mm -hmm. the mall. Yeah. Um, and they gave the link in the line and everything you could go online and see these, uh, who would want to see it, but you could go and see it for free. What, how do you, um, what's your, comment about photojournalism being put online so that people can go and look at it, especially if they're receiving a Pulitzer for it. Oh, well, I think that's okay. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not rigid about it. And, and we, look, the rights revert to the photographer or the author in most of our contracts after a few months, and then they can do whatever they want with it. I actually urge most photographer, all of my photographer and writer friends to hold on to the stuff and not put it out for free in the hope that they might get a book out of it or an anthology or something. Uh, um, some, some agree with me, some are desperate to get the thing out online because they feel like they're not part of the conversation, so to speak. Uh, but uh, you know, at some point after publication, I don't have any problem with that. You know. But so, to be clear, yeah, um, with, with putting content, it up for free, it's you yeah. think it should be um, pay, pay everything should pay. be paywalled, but, but if it's, virtually everything should be paywalled from the in the in the in the first instance for a daily newspaper, at least for 24 hours, but not a photograph, yes, oh, yeah, photograph. I mean, my big uh, the hardest thing to do is to protect the photographers, mm -hmm. and they're the ones under the most pressure along with musicians, as you mm -hmm. probably know. The photographers and the musicians are getting absolutely killed. Um, somebody told me, they said at the Authors Guild uh, uh, general meeting uh, that the um, number of, of songwriters mm -hmm. has been cut in half in the last 10 years, the members of the uh, Songwriters uh, Guild, okay. uh, because they're being ripped off mm -hmm. left and right. But yeah, I, I think photography should, photography should be behind the paywall. And we kept the drone thing behind the paywall. Next question, sir. Yeah. Hi, my name is Patrick Knapp from SEPA. I'm sorry I stepped in a bit late, but I think this question is just within the yeah. realm of the discussion. Um, the National Review right now, some are saying that it could be facing its demise because of uh, a legal case up against it right now against Mark Stein of the National Review for making uh, comments about climate scientist Michael Mann's uh, climate research. And the Columbia Journalism Review has is cited in his lawsuit saying that Stein's comments were deplorable, if not unlawful. Do you think this is, it, where do you fall down on National Review on this? Do you, do you see this as somewhere that journal, journalism schools should be condemning and supporting the downfall of a, a journal like I, National I, Review? I haven't something? filed the story. You gotta clue me in. I don't know what it's about, sorry. Sure. I don't think there's litigation. You mentioned a lawsuit. I don't think there's litigation between Columbia Journalism Review and National Review. No, no. The, uh, I think I'm there sorry, are political differences mm -hmm. between between them. They're cited as a friend of the court in the legal brief, but they're not actually uh, okay. pursuing charges. I mean, I don't wish the demise of any publication. Certainly. No. And uh, okay. I defended. I'm I'm Judith Miller's greatest enemy and critic. Uh, going way back, but when she uh, 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 went to jail to protect her sources, I defended her. <laughs> so, 
I mean, I don't, it's not for me. It's not. It's the principle of the thing, not the uh, not the necessarily the political content of the magazine or the newspaper that should determine whether you support it or not. All right. Okay, you get one more question, my friend. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Novasky, uh, in the interest of freedom of speech. Good, here. yeah, absolutely. Okay, Anton Mikofsky again, Redux. Uh, okay, uh, this concerns research and the scholarly point of view, uh, fair use and scholarly you know, research. Uh, I have uh, been very skeptical of the internet. There's a lot of junk out there, but it, recently I have come to the conclusion that Wikipedia is pretty good, and it's also not for profit. But if you're reading Wikipedia and there's a bibliography on the article, it might be a good article about somebody or something, you want to go to those links because that's what you would do if you were in a library or whatever. Now, if you want to charge for that link, if you want to charge me, I'll put it on my credit card, a dollar or two to read that piece. But I don't want to be told, oh, I can't go to the New York Times or I can't go to Harper's. I have to go like all the way around to find it. And the same thing with YouTube. YouTube is, everybody hates YouTube. It's mocked, it's knocked, it's, it's plagiarism, it's violating copyright. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to do some quick research, I'm a blues scholar, by the way. That's my avocation for 40 years. And I, I did hundreds of photos. If you ever need a blues man, I've got them all in my archive. And recently, the Times did a marvelous piece of journalism uh, on the Sunday Times Magazine a week ago, the 13th this uh, tremendous piece of research. And in there, there, it's about music, right? There's no disc that came with that magazine. If you want to hear what they're talking about, everything else is secondary, somebody's life, right? But Two people. What's your question? Please, what's let wrong? these other, come on. OK, what, comment on the YouTube and whether you think that it's fair for research purposes. And same thing with Wikipedia. Uh, I haven't thought about charging for links to Wikipedia, I assume if somebody links to Harper's, they, they hit the paywall, right? So uh, from off of Wikipedia, if it's a Wikipedia, if it's a footnote in a Wikipedia <clears throat> article, I assume that they hit the paywall, which I think is a good but thing. All, all, I, I don't, I, I yeah. mean, all of these questions are good questions yeah. because the new technology is posing yeah. all of these yeah. challenges to free speech and other things. There's a great article, in my view, in the current, or not in the current, in a, in a issue that came out at the end of last year of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Review about Wikipedia, and it points out that as more and more people watch it, it gets less and less accurate. There are fewer and fewer people correcting the mistakes in it, so Wikipedia has its own problems anyway. I yeah. want to just uh, quickly, yeah. some in response to what the gentleman was asking about earlier uh, from the Century Foundation. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a study done at the new Zuckerman uh, Neurological Institute at Columbia, a, you know, a real controlled test of reading on a screen versus reading on the page and seeing what the retention rate is. I have not seen a good it's study good done. It's got right. to be I, I tell um, uh, the provost, my friend uh, uh, John, um, John Coachworth, I've told him this ten times. You got to get the you got to get the neurological institute to do this study. <clears throat> Someone's got to do it. And what if we find out that the retention rate is thirty percent less, fifty percent less? I mean, the the consequences are could be catastrophic. It's very interesting. Good. Wait, wait. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Neil Barsky. Um, yeah. I'm the chairman of the board. I work with Victor at CJR. Um, I'm a volunteer. Um, <clears throat> I read your uh, article in Harper's. I guess it was in Harper's. I assume it was. Yeah, in um, October. And I assume I paid for it. Yeah. Um, last year, and I thought it was um, incredibly insightful as to the uh, really collective suicide of the publishing industry and what's really happened in the last ten or fifteen years. Um, so I thought, I think it's very observant and it's very tragic um, uh, the state of the art, the world of journalism today. I'm not, though, really sure what your beef, who your beef is with. Um, I'm not sure if you're making a moral argument, a business argument, a political argument. Um, we have a new technology, it's called the internet. Um, consenting adults have agreed that, uh, we, that uh, whether that's newspapers or readers, that they want to read online. Um, publishers can have more readers. Um, readers can read more things more quickly. Um, 
I don't like it either from a business perspective because you've seen this complete implosion of the business model for newspapers and, and, and magazines. And my taste is that says that's a bad thing. But who is who? What would you have us all do? Um, publishing model is over. Um, there are a lot of experiments online to produce business generating or revenue generating uh, online publications. Um, are you tilting at windmills, or is there actually something you'd like to see happen that yeah. would change the, I don't want to use the word history, but it would change the trend that is about a 15-year global trend involving billions of people who have voted, to like they like to read online, rightly or wrongly, for better or worse. Um, that's what's happening. So what would you have happen now? Yeah, we're talking about, what would Kessler call it, the active principle in history? He was quoting uh, the Marxist ideologue. Uh, I don't have a beef with people reading online. If people want to read online, that's fine. I just want them to pay for it. But what would you have happen? People are I would, I would, Oh, my beef is with the publishers and with the ad agencies uh, and with the government for letting Google run roughshod over the publishing business and destroy copyright. And there is a crazy ideology underlying it which masquerades as a democratic, revolutionary uh, principle that information wants to be free. This is the slogan. And uh, <laughs> excuse me, it's just not going to work for, for, for the culture if everything is, uh, if there's no paywalls, if there's no payment for, uh, for the production of culture. Uh, so, um, it, you know, in the short term, there's, uh, I suppose there's some benefits. Yes, The Guardian gets uh, 10 trillion hits on their uh, Snowden uh, scoop, which was handed to them, by the way. Didn't, didn't take any work. Um, um, well, it took work. I mean, investi Up to that point, it took work for Snowden to choose to give it to the Guardian because he respected yeah, but the I'm Guardian's saying it took, work, it, which took a lot of work. Well, but, so, you know, the report, happen. Glenn Greenwald received a dump. Like uh, most reporters, I've been, like I said, I've been, I still am a reporter. It takes a lot of work to find a small truth, uh, just as much work to discover a small truth as a huge truth. And it takes a lot of time and money and effort. And if people think, I, this is one of my new bugaboos, if they think that the Glenn Greenwald Guardian model can replace regular, ordinary, dig it out journalism, they're crazy. And I think there is a tendency to go to think that, that, uh, uh, that uh, what's the new project called that Greenwald's working for? The Intercept. The, the intercept. The are yeah, the, 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 it, it, we're going to replace uh, uh, a thousand reporters with 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 you know a hundred leakers and and, uh, I, and uh, coders or something. Mm -hmm. I have an incredibly yeah. high regard for the model that Harper's is pursuing. Yeah, if it works for Harper's and you yes. don't degrade the value of your writing or yeah. your reading, I applaud you 100 percent. Not working yet. We'll okay. see. Okay, but it's starting Times, to work. The New York Times a for-profit enterprise, a public company, yeah. and it's chosen a different path. No, no, they've it's, got a paywall now. Well, barely. But the point is, how is it barely? Are they? I thought. Am I you, wrong? If you subscribe to the newspaper, you get to read everything for free. You can but link. You same can email. with Harper's. If you it's subscribe, you can read. Every, you go back. You get the archive a, going back to. It's highly permeable. It, my only. Yeah. My only. I agree. Point is, it is too permeable. They yes. make a choice. They make a choice to, no. to reach the maximum number of readers and yeah. generate the maximum amount of revenue their way. What would you have them do differently? A tougher paywall. You saw, did you see the figures in the paper the other day about advertising? Print, rev print advertising revenue went down again a little, you know, 2%, and digital went up about 1% or 1.5%. It is not anywhere near uh, a level where it can replace print advertising revenue. It's not happening, and it's not going to happen. It's not a great advertising medium. So, so the readers are going to have to pay the freight. And one of the answers to your question is, and it's a complicated issue, but is there's a lawsuit that is rattling around which is challenging Google's right to print, to put every book online and make it available under fair use. And the argument of the Authors Guild is that you ought to have to pay to do that before mm -hmm. you can put a book online. So yeah. that's a way of doing it differently. It may be a good or a bad idea, but it's a very different idea than this octopus that is doing what it wants to do right now. Our, our great fear, or at least at the lawyers, our lawyers at the Authors Guild, we're both on the board, is that an Edward Snowden is going to walk out of the University of Michigan Library with the disc with every book 
uh, uh, on the disk and just throw it out on the internet. It's a real fear. It's a real possibility. Some radical internet ideologue who thinks that all books should be available for free. Hi, I'm Corina. I'm a TV reporter. And I want to ask you one question. Which are the main lessons TV should learn from print? Which are the, the biggest advice you could give them first? And second, I agree with your quality. It's still quality, and you need to pay for it. And it's fair for writers, fair for people to work for it. And I think too much free, and the internet diminishes the quality. Well, I'm not an expert on, uh, on TV, but uh, I, I will tell you this uh, anecdote. I was just in Los Angeles with my family visiting friends, and um, uh, at the local, uh, it's called I think it's Channel Nine, which is now owned by CBS. It used to be an independent uh, station out there with lots of reporters. I happen to know the 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 anchor woman, or the co-anchor woman, uh, and her husband, and. Uh, we, we went into, I went in with my kids and my wife and we watched the news broadcast. We actually been there for the uh, earthquake on St. Patrick's Day. So we went in and watched her read the news about, um, about the earthquake. And my friend Joe Frullo uh, was there with us and he says, you, if you notice, you notice something? I said, what? He said, this place is empty. There's nobody in here except the two anchor people and the weather, the weather lady. I mean, there are no reporters, no producers, nobody doing anything. There are a few back in the newsroom. Uh, and I, but I can't tell you that this is a result of the internet. Uh, it might be, though. It may be that the, the bean counters at CBS have decided that uh, there's just no added value in reporting when everything, there's so much stuff is available for free online. Why would you hire a, a, a reporter or a producer at $100,000 a year to go out and actually report on a story. Uh, everyone's going to go to the, the computer and look at it anyway. So the lesson there is not evident. I, you can't pay wall free television, I don't think. I don't know what you do. It would be interesting to see if a station really invested heavily in regular reporting and got a bigger audience. I don't know if that would happen. But, the, but so far, it seems to be going the other direction, just cutbacks. Cut, they just keep winnowing it down until there's almost nobody there. <clears throat> so th what, I'm not answering your question, really. I don't, I don't know the answer. We'll see. Thank you. OK. We have one more question. And then if there's anyone else who's got a burning desire, speak then or forever. <laughs> Think about it. All right, yeah. no pressure. Yes. <laughs> um, my name is Ellen, and I'm a freelancer and a Columbia alum. And I guess I feel like my struggle is I get, um, I get a lot of pushback, because there are people who want very reputable pu publications that want to only pay very little for very good writing. Um, and I feel like there's two things happening. I feel like there's a shift now to content marketing, where a lot of businesses and corporations are paying these former journalists to produce writing that's published in Forbes or whatnot, Forbes on a blog on Forbes, for instance. Or there's a shift to create my own brand so that I can create my blog and hopefully get advertising on my own personal blog right. and somehow build um, myself into like the, some you know, great, uh, uh, my own publishing house, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that, those, those two different things that are happening. Well, it's sort of good luck to the, the poor blogger who thinks that they can get advertising for their tiny site. I mean, if the, if the New York Times and, uh, the, and, the, and Harper's are having trouble getting advertising for their website, imagine how hard it is for, for, the, for an individual. Um, um, you know, I, I'm also, I'm very offended by the way young writers are being exploited by, uh, by publishers. I mean, there's been good stuff written on this. You probably saw there was a piece, I think, in the New York Times by a young writer, young novelist, who had a, a pretty good success with her first novel, Does This Ring a Bell? And, uh, but the second one bombed. Uh, and the response of her publisher was, you know, get out there and, you know, do more free promotion. Um, um, you know, it's, it, it, this, this, I'm, I'm not alone in, in, in point, I'm far from being alone in pointing this out. And it just, as I say, the more, uh, 
writers, especially young writers, give in to this idea that, oh, maybe a miracle can happen, miracles happen, and I can create my own brand, the more the big six publishers or the big five publishers are going to exploit them and say, oh, terrific, I saw your blog. You know, it's, you're, you're a natural marketer, and here's your, your $2,500 advance. Good luck. You know, and, and no distribution in the bookstores. So it's happening, you know, it's, it's really bad what's going on, really, really bad. The difference, of course, in France, I'm not, you probably know that there's a, a no discount law in France and Germany, which is keeping the independent bookstores alive. I mean, if it wasn't for that, they'd be in the same fix we're in. It's, what's, it's happening in England also. Uh, but you cannot discount more than, I think, 5% off the, the, the publisher's list price which guarantees that independent bookstores have a chance to compete. Amazon cannot undersell them. Um, hi, my name is Irene, and I'm in the MS program. So I was just wondering why um, authors and publishers here in America, why can't they collaborate against these monopolies like Amazon and Google and adopt like a similar approach like in Germany, as you mentioned? What's preventing them from doing that? Well, there's, you know, there's a, a capitalist uh, and individualistic, I suppose, ethos here that's, that wars against collective action. Uh, we've had, we have these discussions in the Authors Guild meeting, and um, the former dean of the Columbia Journalism School, Nick Lemon, uh, the other day suggested that uh, we do a workshop on how to do a better blog and how to, print, how to create your own website. And I wish I'd said something. Uh, but I, I guess I was tired that day. But I think that's exactly the wrong thing to do because it sends the wrong message, as I was saying, to young writers that you can miracles happen and you can create your own environment or your own brand or whatever. Um, but it is hard when I, I you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like I know, like I, I, I've proven my theory. It was very hard to go into the Authors Guild a, a meeting after the board meeting, the general, uh, the general meeting, and have people, you know, in their 50s and 60s say to me, I, I, I have no choice. I've got to write for free or I can't get any support from the publisher. I mean, these are people, you know, really depending on the income. You know, ordinary uh, mid-list or below mid-list writers, people who write for trade publications, people who write sort of uh, discrete books, for specialty markets, not general, uh, not general books, uh, you know, they're in a real, they're in a real bind. So for me to lecture them on not writing for free, you know, it doesn't go over so well uh, necessarily. Yeah. Is that a question? Last question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm really too tired, um, but I just feel it would be wrong but, not to speak. And uh, that's, I, I just, my own book is coming out in paperback. I sold it to a publisher in London. Everyone said, why don't you just do an e-book? You know, what we really have to say here is some people are artists. And when Harper's was publishing um, people like Hardy, Edith Wharton, that's a different category. Art is something that needs to be respected. And, um, you know, I'm dying. I'm, I'm eating the the crew today for my whole meal today and I'm exhausted and I've lost my apartment but I've got a beautiful piece of literature that's coming out in a book a proper book in July Great. and I had to fight to make that happen Great. and people are always asking me to do a journalist uh, write an article for free and they also want you to just copy other people's work and I say no I, I do my own reporting I'm an original writer and um, you an artist or someone who really believes in what uh, Rick is talking about has to take a stand and has to fight. And my, I just want to say that it would be wrong for me, who's one of the people who's really, you know, suffering from not being paid, not to struggle up here and say that it does matter and it's worth the fight and it is a real issue. And it's not just because Rick is trying to make it an issue. You know, it's it's a Great. true thing. On that note, uh, can I just say one thing, uh, Victor? Quickly, I would be sat. I would be satisfied uh, if we were treated with the respect due to artisans, not just artists, but artisans. Okay.
Thank you very much. Um, this is terrific, and I just want to say to any students out here, um, we are experimenting this year with a series of dinners, and the next one is with Peter Canby, who runs the fact-checking operation at The New Yorker, and if you want to sign up for it, there's a sign-up sheet right in the back, and Lauren, who is there, can help you find it. And uh, our next Delacorte lecture will be Martha Stewart, uh, very different from Neil, so I mean very different from Rick. So welcome to the conversation. Thanks again, Rick. This is Thank terrific. you. Thanks. Oh, sure. Well, I'm not, yeah, yes. I mean, being against the, I'm not against the, the internet is like, uh, I mean, it's a, 